yeah, 31 years in the retail fertilizer business. I got a pretty good perspective on um, how, to, how to help researchers and farmers and fertilizer dealers kind of put together some of the, the practices that we are trying out on, the, on some of the fields. And, and Lowell Gentry will go through some of those, and I'm going to go through some stuff that we're doing with NREC also. Begin with uh, this past year, and that's pretty hard to see, but that's a planter in May of 2014 that was sitting in a pond that overnight became Waters of the U.S. And in June of 2015, that was the guys trying to spray their soybeans. Had a lot of stuck sprayers. Some of my dealers thought it was this bad, and it may be hard to see, but I think maybe in the river bottoms it might have been, but I, I don't think in most cases it was. One of the spreaders that got stuck, I did find out later on that they had to bring in two high hose to get that sprayer out of that field. And then the last ditch effort for corn. And I bring that up because we had a lot of nitrogen loss throughout the state, and we also had a lot of root damage with some of that standing water. And so some of the end rate trials that we were doing showed that we needed more nitrogen for unit of yield. And in, in reality, we had some damage to the corn that probably threw off some of the, the end rate trials. So that's a lot of the stuff that I do around the state too. IFCA has 1,100 members in their the retail fertilizer business, they're in the distribution business, they're in the equipment business, whatever that, that tie into the fertilizer uh, business uh, is, is some of our membership. Jean Payne is the president of our uh, association and you'll, she's around the state speaking all the time too. She's probably uh, been to twice as many uh, meetings as I have this winter and, and we've been to a lot together. This is a map of the eight Illinois EPA targeted watersheds. That's where I started out in, it was those watersheds there. They're targeted because of, of nitrate uh, impairment within the, within the central part of the state. Those are water bodies mainly that, that provide drinking water to certain communities. And, and we had to try to come up with some better management practices for nitrogen. And, and if you look at, if you go back to 2012 and you think about 2012, we had very poor utilization of nitrogen. The nitrogen we applied stayed in the soil, basically. 2013, we thought maybe we could get by with a little bit less nitrogen, but what happened in May, we had a lot of, of rainfall. We had a flushing. The, the, the um, lakes in central Illinois had unprecedented loading of nitrates that year because of the flush of 2012 nitrogen. A survey we did in, in the September of 2012 showed us that we had about 130 pounds of N on a statewide average left in the soil and that ended up getting flushed in the spring along with a little bit of the fall applied nitrogen from 13. Lake Springfield that year hit right at nine parts per million. The drinking water standard I'm sure you heard is 10 parts per million and the legislature was in session at that point in time. We got really worried that they were gonna start passing out bottled water in our state capital and that would have been a real black eye for ag at that point in time even though we can't control mother nature and, and mother nature has a trump over anything we do um, in agriculture. 2014 and 2015 were pretty much the opposite of, of the utilization in 24, or 2012 because we had really high yields for the most part in the state. 15 may not have been quite as good as 14, but for the most part we had really good, good yields in, in our uh, watersheds. This is uh, showing the Lake Springfield watershed right now where they're sitting with uh, nitrates. They're running about 5.3. Report came in yesterday, they're like at 4.8, so they're fluctuating there. That December rain, that overland flooding that we got, raised them up to this level. Once that nitrates get up in a lake like that, you can't get them back out because there's, the water's too cold, there's no denitrification going on in the lake, so it, it's kind of locked in there. Another one we deal with is Lake Decatur. They're running their nitrate removal. Springfield has no way to take nitrates out. Decatur does. They've got a nitrate removal system. They're pulling the nitrates out currently out of the, out of the water that, that's uh, from the Sangamon that's going into the lake. Another thing that we need to talk about and, and start looking at, especially in central Illinois, is how much tillage we're doing. We're going to have to get back to no-till somewhat. Lake Decatur is spending $10 million a year for the next um, six years to dredge that lake and get it back to the basin it once was 30 years ago to get the capacity back up. There's a lot of silt and sediment that's flowing in there. If you look in the Macon County area, you'll see that a lot of, well, Macon County and Champaign County and Pike County, there's a lot of tillage that takes place in those, in those counties. Lake Vermilion is another area that, we've, um, that we work in quite a bit. They're at about 8.1 currently. They're staying fairly flat. During the course of last June, for 50 days, they ran their nitrate removal the month of May and June and in a little bit into July to remove nitrates. They've got a capacity to do that. They haven't got to that point yet in this winter, 
and we're hoping that some of the changes we made last fall may be helping them. So during the course of um, discussion with the water folks there, we decided to ask the retailers in that watershed to come in and start using 0460 again. So they access triple super rather than diammonium phosphate for their fall application of, of phosphorus. We don't know if that helped, but you know, you can think about it in variable rate applications, how much nitrogen we may be taking out of that system by just moving to 0460 rather than 18460. They were back in June of last year, you can see they were 11.7. Springfield never got above 1.8 last summer, even though it had all that water coming in, but that's due to the, the size of the lake, the size of the watershed, and also uh, dependent upon denitrification losses. What's the status of fall applied nitrogen? And I, I bring this up after those slides about the lakes because up in central Illinois, we're a heavy fall nitrogen application uh, area up in there. Uh, the, the central part of the state, Springfield, Decatur, all those areas are surrounded by a lot of fall nitrogen. We tried to do the best management practice last fall by waiting until the soil temperature got below 50 degrees. Well, what happened was after we started applying, when it did get to 50 degrees, instead of trending downward, it trended back up. And so through the month of November and December, we had uh, nitrification taking place. We had the, the bacteria was working on the end serve, it's breaking the end serve down, getting into the nitrogen. And so of course, we've got more nitrification that's taking place. And prior to, we've got two sampling dates on some of this up until January 1st we've got about a 50% uh, nitrate, 50% ammonium. We want to keep everything in the ammonium form because it's a, it's a positive and attached to the soil. But in the case of this fall ammonia that we applied this past year, we had a higher degree of nitrate uh, conversion in that uh, system. And I'll just briefly, we're using the NWATCH program and you guys may have heard about the NWATCH program. It's a way to track it and, and document nitrates and ammonium, the conversion. It's a nice window into the soil. It's a nice way to look at your application to determine when your nitrogen is going through the process, when nitrification is taking place, what percents in ammonium, what percents in, in uh, nitrate. And it's a very simple procedure to do, and it, it really gives you a good idea. So we use this system to track nitrates, especially in that central part of the state on this, this fall ammonia. And you can see the, the weather here. The 50 degree line is probably about right in, in that neighborhood. And you can see we got through most of December and November, we were trending the four inch at the four inch level around that 50 degree uh, mark on the, on the temperature. And so that caused us to get in about that 47 to 44 percent in the ammonium form where we would have liked to have been about 80 percent at that point in time. And, and previously in 2014 and 2015, that's where the soil test would have shown that we were, that our, our uh, conversion from ammonium to nitrate was very slow in those two years. Of course, we had a really cold winter too. Another year that looks similar to this that Bob Hayes is showing me is 2002. We had a warm, a warm wet winter and we had a high, high amount of nitrification taking place in that system. Some other sites that we tested weren't, weren't quite as bad. We had about 56% in the ammonium form and the remainder in, in nitrate. So that's something we're doing. We've got a whole new set of sites that we've tested here in the last uh, two days. Um, the results are starting to come back in. And in Lake Springfield, uh, the nitrification process has continued, it seems like, since we took some samples over there. And we've got even a higher degree of nitrates there. We're really concerned with Lake Springfield since they don't have any way to take out the nitrates. Gene Payne has contacted the, the retailers in that area and asked them to make sure we stabilize any nitrogen that's going on currently. And they've been running since last Friday over in that area with anhydrous ammonia and any other nitrogen sources, maybe stabilize those. Or if you can uh, move some of your nitrogen applications to later in the season to try and do that to offset some of this. We don't have a buffer when we're sitting at five parts per million in Lake Springfield, we don't have that buffer for a heavy spring flush. And if we get that, we could, we could, be in prop, we could have problems. Just looking at the NWATCH um, program, this is what it would look like out in the field when you're using a template to pull the samples. This happened to be in Lake Springfield back in 2014. And usually, normally by the end of the season, we have very little nitrates in the field. And that's what we were watching for in order to trigger an uh, application of cover crops. And I got this, this result back on my desk and it showed 33 parts per million of nitrate in left over in August and I got really excited about it. So I took my boys out there to, to work with me and this just shows how descriptive um, NWATCH can be. I took the boys that were pulling the samples out and, and we went out there and looked at it and what we found out was they'd cleared the area of corn when they were doing that so we had no uptake of nitrogen. So we just kept building the nitrates and that's what, that's what ended up happening with that site. We went back in to the cornfield and there's very little left over. And this, is, this would show what it would have, should have looked like 
when they were pulling the samples within the, the growing corn. So we try to do uh, as we thaw out in the spring and then three more sampling dates ending with about a VT or an R1 sampling date to see what nitrates are left. We also do it with NSERV, and this is a spring application of NSERV, and you can see that we had, um, with, with the NSERV, we had about 74% in the ammonium form. Without, we were at 80% in the nitrate form last year. So that's, and rather than saying eight bushel better or seven bushel better, we like to look at it in terms of nitrates and ammonium within that soil profile. Source rate, time and place, nitrogen management system. Last year, um, on-farm research that, that was done with Dr. Knopfsanger and, and a group of us, we looked at timing of nitrogen applications with different sources, and we also looked at the nitrate sampling, nitrates and ammonium sampling. The best method of application last year we found was 50 pounds of N applied at planting time with an additional, with the rest of the nitrogen applied at side dress. Uh, anytime we do a split application, we see a, a higher yield advantage to that, and, and that was in Central Illinois. We had some fall applied, we had some fall applied um, total amounts of N, we had some spring applied total amounts of N, and neither one of them came up to the split application, especially when you got a planting time application followed by a side dress. Do we have some easy buttons in, in ag uh, for the Illinois Nutrient Loss Reduction Strategy? We like to think of the MRTN as, as one of the systems we can use. It's, on the, it's in the strategy. The MRTN is not perfect, but it's a, gives you a, a, an idea of what nitrogen rates you should use. And while I'm talking about the MRTN, if anybody's interested in doing a side dress in rate trial down in this, this area, we need some Southern Illinois nitrogen trials. Uh, it's six rates replicated three times. We pay $1,000 for a farmer to a grower that, that does one and then we collect the data and it goes into the, the calculator that is the MRTN. That is the basis for nitrogen recommendations in Illinois based on the agronomy handbook. Use of nitrification inhibitors in early spring, in fall, it, it's, it's recommended, that's another easy button. Uh, fall BMPs are maybe get the fertilizer on early in the fall or wait until uh, in the spring to put on your fertilizer and try to avoid those applications on frozen or snow covered uh, soils in the winter time. Split applications of nitrogen, I talked about that. Uh, cover crops are a big part of this. And then just basically in, in our tile, heavily tile drained areas, having better management practices. Because if you saw the map of Illinois, I'm sure you saw that earlier, that area of in central Illinois across to the western part of Illinois is heavy in nitrate losses. The losses on phosphorus are more towards the southern end. Under a system of nutrient loss reduction strategy, can we have high yields? And yes, we can. We can have them by taking a look at, at Liebig's law of the minimum and thinking about each component other than nitrogen. A lot of times we focus on nitrogen, we focus on nitrogen rates. Let's focus on plant health. Let's talk about, you know, what happens if we lose 20 or 30 bushel because we didn't go out and scout the fields and we get a leaf disease in, causes losses to the corn plant. If we don't take out that 20 or 30 bushel of corn, we're leaving nitrogen in the field and it goes into the environment. If we don't have the right genetics, maybe we, we miss that by 20 or 30. Sit down with your, your folks and really study what hybrids you're planting. That, can make a, that makes a big difference in how much corn you're going to raise. You talk about uh, other practices like other nutrition. Uh, Lowell Gentry is going to talk about something he's finding in, in the water. Maybe it's sulfur, maybe it's zinc, maybe it's some micronutrients you need to apply with your crop. As we go up that yield scale higher up, we need to have all those things, those factors balanced basically to maximize yield. If we maximize yield, we'll take out the nitrogen. We don't need to put on tenfolds amount of nitrogen and not pay attention to everything else. It's about the proper utilization of the nitrogen that we're applying by utilizing the other factors that, that go into crop production. Research is feeding the nutrient loss reduction strategy and basically the Illinois Nutrient Research and Education Council is key to why in Illinois we're kind of a island with stormy waters all around us with all the things that are going on. This research is, fun, is funding, this, your dollars are funding the research that keeps us in line with, with um, practices and, and trying to prove practices and those kind of things. But also it brings in the environmental groups. They sit on the board. Uh, somebody from the, the, uh, the environmental law policy sits on that board. Another environmentalist sits on that board. Marsha Wilhite from Illinois EPA sits on that board. They see the kind of research we're bringing out to the country. 20% of the money that you folks put into the nutrient law, or into the, um, the uh, Illinois Nutrient Research and Education Council has to be on farm research. So it's not these small plots, it's the large plots, it's the real working fields that, that we're wanting to do the research on. And I'm gonna show you some of the stuff that's being done. 
Um, this one is up at Lexington, Illinois. There's five treatments replicated three times in there. There's 15 tile lines being monitored. There's a zero zone, there's a fall application, there's a spring application, there's splits, and there's cover crops. These automatic samplers have 24 bottles in there. Once they, once they start filling, there's a flow event. There's a telephone signal that goes to four graduate students at ISU. They, ha they know they got six hours to come out and start collecting the bottles and collecting the water and go back to the lab and start analyzing. They've been running this for uh, two years. We're in our second crop now, and that's a corn-soybean rotation by the year. It's not the same year uh, like one of the other projects we're working with. I work with Dr. Lowell Gentry on this one in Douglas County. This is a corn-soybean rotation. There's 36 tile lines being monitored. There's, there's six treatments replicated three times in here, and this is a, a working farm. These are large plot, large-scale plots. We're doing a fall application. We're doing a split application. We're doing a reduced application. We're doing spring, and we're doing cover crops within this system, too. Following what's coming out of the tile line, understanding what those losses are in the fall application system coming through the tile lines. During that December rainfall, we saw an uptick in nitrates coming out of the tile line from the, the fall application. And that fall application, I guarantee you, was made the last day we could go. It was on a Sunday, and we rained on Monday. So I was there, and we helped put that in. So those are, those are the kind of projects that we, kind of a proof of concept is what Lowell would, would say about these. This just shows you the treatments of, the, of that field. I don't need to go into that. This shows you a beaver dam. And so sometimes nature throws a curveball at you. Within that system, the beavers have come across into the neighbor's field, blocked the, blocked the flow, and we're backing up into some of our, into some of our tiles. So uh, I had my helper, Jason, and, and John, who helps Lowell, go in there, and we try to dig it out. Within one day, they put the darn thing back overnight. So we may have to have a midnight hunt at some point in time. We've tried to hire a, a trapper, and I haven't really found anybody to come up there and trap them yet. This is a rainfall simulator. So another project was taking a look at phosphorus runoff within a no-till system, within a strip-till with broadcast fertilizer, and strip-till with deep placement. And this, this uh, uh, framework here has a skirt that goes up, and, and um, you've got a framework under here, and then collection for the phosphorus and water that comes off here. And it's a rainfall simulator is what it mainly is. Or when you raise the skirt and you have 40 mile an hour winds, it's a kite. It's in, and they are, they are fastened down, but they do move. And that just shows you how the, how the water collect, collects in that uh, uh, six by six or four by six uh, area. And this is on flat Illinois, Illinois ground in central Illinois again is where this is, was done. And actually, if you look at the strip till deep placement, we're gonna have a lot less phosphorus coming off of there, even though that probably a little bit of this may be from soil disturbance from the strip till. And, uh, but you can see there's a little bit of difference between the, the applied fertilizer from the losses. And that's on flat. Illinois, Central Illinois ground. Another, another trial that we're working on is a nine-year trial where we've, we've gone across, um, we have seven rate, rates of fertilizer and there's three replications, or three fields with two replications in each one of them. We've soil tested across the four rows, 10 foot strip, zero to four, four to eight, and eight to 12, and every seven and a half inches across those, those uh, four rows to find out how should we soil test when we've got basically a strip till uh, uh, deep band of uh, fertilizer. This is some work that I worked with on with Dr. Fernandez, and, and it's pretty interesting. For one thing, we every year for the last nine years, we've taken off 2,500 pounds of soil in a little soil sample bag uh, each year. And somewhere down at KSI, they've got a really nice garden of Drummer Flanagan. This just shows the, the outlay of how that laid out. One of the things we took a look at is this is the strip, this is the band. We're using RTK with this, of course. And then we looked at the fertilizer rates as they moved out from that band and, and out to three and a half, 3.75 inches. And what we found out was until we, we were pretty consistent with our, with our fertilizer rates and amounts down in that band, this, is, this would be the four to six inch line where that band is and it stayed pretty much in that band and until you get to 3.75 inches and then um, we were actually between row positions. So it, it's, it was interesting to look at this. One of the things that we looked at was with a zero zone, some of this hasn't had fertilizer on it for nine years, and you can see that we're deficient as we're going this direction, we're deficient in soil test, in soil test uh, nitrogen, or soil test phosphorus, I mean, this is a phosphorus slide. And then with the maintenance amount, you can see that, that we're pretty much um, even with that amount, except we talk about strip-till banding of fertilizer. We talk about can we more efficiently use the fertilizer in that band and get by with less fertilizer 
because of the roots pulling all the fertilizer out of that band. Well, we came to find out that uh, the roots are not only not pulling it all out of that band, they're investigating the rest of the surface, and so we've depleted the fertilizer in the between row positions at the zero to four inch level. So it's important to understand if you're doing strip tilling and deep banding, maybe move that band around a little bit because you are going to take out away from the in row position. This is just the, the highest rate of fertilizer, and even in the high rate of fertilizer, you can see that we're depleting across the in between row positions. K2O. Uh, it was similar to that, except in the in-row position. We did this experiment where we used RTK, so we stayed in the row the whole time. Well, if you, if you know about fo potash, it mainly is contained within the stalk or fodder of the, of the plant you're growing, and it flushes out, so it flushed out on top of that row. And we actually had a build in the upper four inches of the soil surface from the, uh, not fertilizer application, but actually the recycling of nutrients from down deep and brought back in and, and flushed back out of the corn stalks. The main thing to talk about here is if you're doing soil testing and you've got strips of fertilizer in there, the year you're doing it, if you've got a band, it would be in the row probably, soil sample in that row and then probably take three probes outside the row to get a good composite. And that's what uh, Dr. Fernandez has found in his research is the best method for pulling those soil samples. This one's really hard to see, but this is up at, up at uh, Tawanda, Illinois. And um, this is a cover crop project where we've taken a one watershed and 800 acres and put cover crops in it, another watershed, no cover crops, and that's the only practice changes. They're monitoring a drainage district tile system, a 24 inch tile, and some of it's being done with strip till uh, in cover crops. Um, this is some of that would look like, but anyway, the monitoring station is an automatic sampler again, and we're monitoring that main, that main feed out of that 800 acre watershed to see if we can make a change using just cover crops in the amount of nitrates coming out. The MRTN, you can download that on your iPhone. If you want to, if you want to have the MRTN app, just go to your uh, iPhone uh, store and um, Google MRTN. There will be a Wisconsin and an Illinois one probably come up. Pick the Illinois and you can have the MRTN right on your phone and it will include split applications. N-rate trials. This is a lot of what I do. This, is, this shows a, an aerial photo of a replicated study. This is a side dress application. And a lot of this information goes into, all this information goes into building the MRTN and to continue to update it. We do it with um, uh, automatic controllers, basically, and we can stamp in an in-rate trial or we can do it manually, however a guy wants to do it, um, and pull the information back out with a combine yield monitor. This shows the difference between 2014, if you can see this or not, but this is a fall spring application where we do the comparison. And in, in 2014, those lines are basically the same. But you take a look at 2015, the spring application was more efficient in nitrogen utilization and yield than what the fall was. This is a, a corn on corn in Champaign County, the optimum. This is, if, and this is always show out the, I always like to show the, the one that really works. This worked perfectly for what the MRTN was predicting you needed for nitrogen, about 195 pounds of N to get the maximum return on the, on the nitrogen. And that's the response curve that we, we try to generate with each farmer's. So if anybody wants to participate in in-rate trials down here, we are more than happy to, to work with you and I've got uh, some contact information we can do that with. One thing about it, we talk about nitrogen rates, we talk about high yield. This one is Piatt County. Piatt County is the number one yielding county in the state this year. And we had an in-rate trial, we happen to have one there. So at 300 bushel, 223 pounds of N is what, is what we got for that uh, rate of N in that one. So, talking about the MRTN NRA calculator, uses all recent data, converts yield response to economic return, but the main thing is it provides a guideline more than a recommendation, and it's seldom exact for any given field. That's why you need to do these on your own farm or play with nitrogen yourself to determine what your nitrogen rate would be. That makes you not only responsible and it gives you a reliable nitrogen rate, but it also gives you a defensible position as to why you're using a certain nitrogen rate. This is just our, our code of practices we talk about. We've talked about not applying nitrogen too early, not applying to frozen snow covered ground. Those are the things that your retailers are working on. They're signing up, to they're doing the pledge with, with IFCA. And we're talking about these kind of practices that when I started, when I go back in my career, I would have had guys spreading fertilizer all winter anytime I could. I would have had guys putting on fall pneumonia back in, in my day up there, and they were applying 40 pounds more because that was my recommendation because I knew we was gonna lose some. I wouldn't make that statement now. And I asked Bob Haft about it, and basically it was in the agronomy handbook back in, in the 70s and 80s to apply 40 pounds more if he was in a fall system. 
we made a lot of changes. We made a lot of great changes in how we do things. You know, is this, is, that's a spreader. You probably can't see it there, but, you know, wheel tracks in a snow field. We got um, runoff coming off. Is that really a BMP? I don't think so. And that's my contact information. Like I said, I'll be around all through noon and everything. If anybody would like to, to participate in any of the projects, in watch uh, the, um, the um, NRATE trials, get a hold of me. I've got some forms you can take with you and, and my contact information, and we can get together.